Hey there, fellow travelers. For anyone who's watching, uh, just I decided to do kind of a spontaneous live stream here. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me and uh, got the microphone. Uh, still, still getting used to this new uh, this live stream thing and uh, thing. It's not really my uh, cup of tea just yet, but hopefully it will be. We'll see if some people come live and they can tell me whether they can hear me or not. So uh, I was actually thinking I want to do some live streams, uh, start doing this more regularly. Uh, it's fun to interact with you guys. And uh, especially as we are leading up to the Rings of Power, it's going to be a fun time to be a Tolkien fan for sure over the next several months. Uh, I was going to just talk about some things associated with the Rings of Power, but uh, somebody wrote a uh, somebody. I've, I've seen this article today making the rounds. Um, on the interwebs with uh, in Tolkien circles and um, it was published on medium. A couple of people brought it to my attention and uh, it's gotten enough attention from people that I just wanted to do a, a rebuttal of it because it's really, it's, it's the kind of thing that a lot of people would read and think that it sounds really smart. And the person knows probably knows what uh, he's talking about, but he don't, he don't, it's really bad. Um, Obviously, an intelligent individual, uh, not a bad writer, but just factually horrendous. And um, and obviously, the big the big thing is he is. Uh, he, I'm not going to mind read. I'll I'll hold off on that. Let me just go through this article. So the article I'm referring to is it's titled "No Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings Isn't Christian." Uh, subtitled "The Relig Religion Sure Likes to Say Otherwise," from Jonathan Poletti. Uh, published four days ago, I guess, as of when I wrote, when I'm doing this. So yeah, um, first line here, Christians have a long history of trying to claim J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings as basically a Christian text. I, I'm just going to go through, kind of hit the high points of this thing. It's going to be pretty straightforward to uh, rebut, refute, whatever term you want to you want to use. Um, but you guys know if you've paid any attention to this channel, to the podcast, to the Tolkien Road over the years, uh, especially over the last couple of years, we've done a lot on this topic on what exactly Tolkien meant by this idea that the Lord of the Rings is uh, fundamentally religious and Catholic. Um, and we've done a lot on Tolkien's own faith and how that informed his works. And my goal is never to push that on anybody and say, hey, you gotta, you've got to believe this if you want to appreciate uh, if you want to actually like understand Lord of the Rings or appreciate Tolkien or something like that. I believe it enhances your understanding and your um, enjoyment of the text, right? Especially if you can approach these things with an open mind. Um, but it's, I, I'm, I'm never trying to be heavy handed about it, right? However, when people come at uh, Tolkien's faith and when people try to twist things that he said, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to have words for you. I'm going to have words for you. I'm going to keep this civil. All right. So, uh, yeah, Christians have a long history of trying to claim J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings is basically a Christian text. Um, I don't know if many that claim it is basically a Christian text. Um, that's pretty. That's a pretty bold statement. There probably some are, but I don't. I wouldn't say it's basically a Christian text. Um, that's just that. That's a very strong, immediate misunderstanding of what I think most people who have written on this subject would claim about it. Uh, goes on to say with the new Amazon adaptation, the rings of power, there's sure to be more rounds of it all strangely disconnected from facts. Let's take a look at Tolkien's religiosity and the godless book that he wrote. God, godless book that he wrote. Let me just stop there for a second. Okay. Uh, bless your heart. All right, Jonathan. Okay. Um, 1956, uh, letter 184 four to W H Auden, uh, one eighty three for W H Auden, um, 1956 Tolkien said this, the Lord of the ring in the Lord of the Rings. The conflict is not basically about freedom, though that is naturally involved. It is about God and his sole right to divine honor. The Eldar and the Numenorians believed in the one, the true God and held worship of any other person in abomination. All right. Tolkien basically says there it's about God, right? Um, he he basically says um, it's anything but godless right there. Okay, so this idea that Lord of the Rings is um, that like God is somehow absent from it, um, it. It's it's a it's an interesting one for people to use because 
Tolkien would never have said that he was trying to write a book that's like a um, an evangelization tract or something like that. That's just absolutely not what he intended to do. Um, hey, I, can you guys hear me? By the way, let me know if let me somebody chat me and tell me you can hear me because otherwise I'm just talking into uh, into the nothingness. I get uh, I'm not quite to the live stream pro level yet where I'm confident about that. <clears throat> um, so yeah. He lists off some different books. There's a whole lot of books that have been written on, you know, this subject of like, you know, understanding kind of like illuminating the text of the Lord of the Rings with a uh, background from Tolkien's own faith. Um, and he goes through and makes some other claims, which aren't really important. Um, I want to deal with he brings up uh, he, he brings up a quote from literary critic Edmund Fuller. Uh, five by five. Thank you. Thank you, John Nelson. I appreciate it. You are appreciated, sir. Uh, he brings up this quote from literary critic Edmund Fuller. Uh, he quotes he quotes Edmund Fuller as saying, In this story, there is no overt theology or religion. There is no mention of God. No one is worshipped. There are no prayers. Wow, sounds pretty stark, right? Except you click on the thing he links to, right? In the actual text, it's on Google Books. And here's the full paragraph of what this individual, Edmund Fuller, wrote. Now we shall shift to another level of meaning. In this story, there is no overt theology or religion. There is no mention of God. No one is worshipped. There are no prayers, though there are invocations of great names of virtue. Yet implicit in the conflict between good and evil is a limited eschatology for the third age of Middle Earth. A theology contains the narrative rather than being contained by it. Grace is at work abundantly in the story. In the Jo christian scriptures, God is seen at work in history, taking an initiative, intervening in the affairs of his creatures. All right. So and, and, and it kind of goes on in that vein. Right. So it turns out that the Edmund Fuller quote wasn't there. Edmund Fuller did not like say that to say that no one should bother reading Lord of the Rings in this way. Right. Or no one should have a, uh, you know, that, that that the Lord of the Rings is a completely godless book. That wasn't Edmund Fuller's point. It was actually the exact opposite. He was trying to help people understand how one could see uh, Tolkien's faith illuminating how, what Tolkien might have meant when he said the Lord of the Rings is, of course, fundamentally religious and Catholic. Right. Um, so one point of, I, I truly hope that this, this guy, Jonathan, that he was just, he wasn't being dishonest, like intellectually dishonest here, but that he was actually just, you know, like kind of found a quote that, um, you know, he was writing this article busily and just didn't bother to read the full context. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt there, but pretty clear that's not, he's, he's pulling Edmund Fuller's quote out of context and using it for his own purposes. Um, yeah, so is kind of skim skimming it. He does some like really strange biographical analysis in this thing. And uh, he says Tolkien was, he was Catholic because of his mother. That's kind of the next big headline here. Um, and it seems what he's saying is so, so here, here's what he says. He gives the background of like Mabel's um, you know, Mabel's family had uh, uh, Mabel converted from Baptist to Catholic when he was, when Tolkien was around age eight or when, Tolkien's around age eight, a scandal to her Baptist family, and they persecuted her for it. As I read Humphrey Bart Carpenter's treatment of the period, I'm understanding Mabel Tolkien to have mostly been trying to find people who would be nice to her. That wasn't Baptist, and for her, it, was it wasn't necessarily Catholics either. Around 19 1902, as we learn, she took the boys on long Sunday walks in search of a place of worship that appealed to her. Soon she discovered the Birmingham Oratory, a large church in the suburb of Edgbaston that was looked after by a community of priests. That specific church appealed to her. That's that's his emphasis, specific. And from Carpenter's narration, we'd understand that the key was its connection to John Henry Newman. The famous priest had died in 1890, but his spirit still presided. Uh, I, I don't really get his point here. I, it sounds like his point is that, well, okay, well, you know, he was Catholic. She, his mom became Catholic and everything, but it, but it sounds like they were just nice to her. And that's, but lots of people are nice to you, but you don't adopt their religion, right? And and furthermore, like that's a thing that a lot of Christians do. That's that's what Christ told Christians to do is show kindness to people, especially like the fatherless, the widow, the orphan. Right. Mabel was a widow. Her sons would be orphans after she passed away. Right. That's what Christians are commanded by Christ to do is is take care of those people. Right. Reach out to those people. Take care of them. Right. Um, so I don't exactly get his point here, but he seems to think that, you know, this like Mabel's, uh, you know, Mabel's adoption of Catholicism was purely superficial. Okay. Um, you, if you say so, 
Uh, all right, next, Newman Newman was an unusual man, an unusual Catholic. He goes back in time to talk about Newman, who founded the Brigham Oratory, who Catholic, like, really, by the way, um, Tolkien never would have interacted with him, nor would Mabel have. Uh, Newman would have passed away several years before um, Mabel even became Catholic, years before, I believe years before Tolkien was even born in 1892. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why he includes this here, but he does. Um, it's There's a lot of like non sequiturs in this article too, like the points that he seems about to make and then he never makes an actual point. He just kind of quotes facts. Um, as a young adult, Tolkien all but apostatized. Well, I sure, but he came back to it pretty strongly and was Catholic for most of his life. Right. And has many quotes where he talks about how important Catholicism Christianity is to him. Uh, he says Tolkien liked the Eucharist and disliked most priests. Um, so he talks about, yeah, this, this quote in 1963, well, I mean, I don't understand how that goes against Lord of the Rings being a Christian book, right? Uh, the Eucharist was important to him. Therefore, Lord of the Rings wasn't. Is that one of your points? Again, just doesn't make a lot of sense here. Uh, along the way, Tolkien confesses his ongoing doubts. He wrote in a 1963 letter to his grandson, the temptation to unbelief, which really means rejection of our Lord and his claims is always there within us. So have you ever met a Christian? Because most Christians will tell you that from time to time, we have doubts, right? Like that's not like faith isn't never having doubts. That's just not how it works. Um, I is just it's such a strange art. I thought to myself as I was reading this earlier, I was like, is this just some kind of epic troll? Is he just kind of trying to get people worked up? Is he trying to do clickbait with this title? Because the, the reasoning here is just so poor. I mean, it's. I don't mean to be mean, but I would be a little embarrassed if I had written this. I would want to take it down after a little bit of correction, right? It's just, it's all over the place and it doesn't actually get to your point. And it's so easily refuted by the facts. Did Tolkien believe in the Bible? Um, and then he quotes this from On Fairy Stories, one of my favorite quotes. And the Gospels contain a fairy story or a story of a larger kind, which embraces all the essence of fairy stories. They contain many marvels peculiarly artistic, beautiful, and moving, mythical in their perfect self-contained significance. Um, again, not really sure what he means there, like what, what that has to do with anything, but I mean, and then he goes on to talk about how uh, Lewis, um, with that he talked to C.S. Lewis and um, and helped explain Christianity to, to C.S. Lewis by referring to it as a true myth. What, Tolkien fully believed in the historicity of the gospels, right? That's his point is not to deny the historicity of the gospels. Um, and like it, the idea, the way, the better way to understand this is that like Tolkien meant like, it's the fairy story that actually happened, right? It's the fairy tale that actually happened in history. It's the historical fairy tale, right? Um, so again, he's pulling things out of context and using them for these kind of like surface level jabs at Christianity, uh, so it's becoming increasingly clear that his problem isn't so much with like people's like talking about Lord of the Rings as being Christian as it is with just Christianity, right? He, he doesn't really like, it doesn't seem like he likes Christianity a whole lot. All right, moving on. Um, do, do, do. Yeah. Um, in late phase tink of tinkering with his mythology, Tolkien wrote in the Silmarillion of Middle Earth, having a creator deity and lower spirits called Valar. That's just completely off base, right? Um, Ainu Lindale goes back well before Lord of the Rings, right? That's not a late phase tinkering with his mythology. Um, and I mean, literally, he was dealing with these same issues as he was writing Lord of the Rings. Um, so I'm sorry, that's just wrong. If Tolkien was really a Christian writer, he'd have done everything different. I, this is amazing to me. Like you're telling a guy who is a Christian and a writer how he needs to do things differently if he's going to write a truly Christian book. Who, who are you? <laughs> like, where do you get off, man? Uh, that's, that's just crazy. I, I can't like, I can't fathom having this mindset where you just look at this and say, like, let, let me tell you how to actually do it. Christian when like, you're obviously not a Christian or maybe you are, I don't know what kind of Christian you are when you're talking to another Christian this way. Um, but yeah, like, where do you, where do you even get off talk, like telling him how to actually write the novel he, sh he wanted to write? That's just, 
mind boggling. That's just mind boggling. Um, so the real problem was that Christians didn't have books they really liked. Okay. I think there's plenty of books that Christians really liked. I mean, it's just strange comments. He goes on and mentions, you know, the thing about Dungeons and Dragons, and there was a lot of evangelicals that didn't like it. I think we're kind of past that phase, quite honestly, in history. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and here's the other thing. He, he speaks of, he speaks of Lord of the Rings at different points in this article is like, uh, involving, you know, sorcery and that sort of thing. Right. Um, that's a, what's funny to me is there are actually Christians who will like, uh, come down morally against the Lord of the Rings and, uh, middle earth stories because they insist that they contain sorcery and this sort of thing. Um, but that's, that's a very, like, that's a very poor argument. Gandalf, uh, the wizard, like the good wizard of the Lord of the Rings, we don't see him doing any, if at it, like any sorcery really throughout the story. I mean, you can maybe argue there's a couple of instances where he like brings light into a situation, but when we're talking about like, especially if we're talking about like some kind of black magic, he's definitely not doing that. Right. Um, he's not the kind of wizard that, uh, a lot of people generally associate with wizard dumb. Right. Um, there's much more in the sense that he's this, uh, he's a prophet, um, with something like miraculous powers. Right. And he's also a supernatural being, right. He's a, um, uh, he is a lesser God. He's a Maiar. Okay. So again, this thing is just, it's all over the place. Uh, Tolkien's work could be read as a new scripture. Uh, it's been so devoutly studied. The Lord of the Rings may well qualify as post Christian scripture. Um, I mean, Okay, what's your point? It, it again, like it's not. There's nothing wrong with looking at this text and understanding. Wow, Tolkien was doing this over here. That's a whole lot like you know this particular Christian theme right here. And look at this. Tolkien said, "Hey, it's of course fundamentally religious and Catholic, right?" Uh, what did he mean by that? Okay, so there's nothing wrong with studying this text from uh, the perspective of Tolkien's Christian faith, right? Was saying like, how did it influence the development of this? Any more than there's anything wrong with looking at his love of language and saying, how did this influence this as well? Especially because the uh, evidence from his letters, the evidence from his other writings is so strong that this was an influence, right? That these things were influences upon him, okay? Um, the whole question of denying that uh, evil is an absolute in Middle Earth, right? Which Tolkien did, right? That's a very Christian way of understanding uh, good and evil, right? That good and evil aren't these like diametrically opposed forces. That good, absolute good is the only absolute, right? But that evil is this kind of perversion of the absolute good, right? So, um, and, you know, he kind of, he he couches all of this and, you know, the, the occasion for writing about this is that, oh, we got this rings of power, which is of course going to be this really big thing coming up in just a few, coming up in just a few months. Uh, people are getting really excited about it, but here's the thing. And, and I'm sorry if this blows your mind, Jonathan. Okay. But Numenor, very religious place. Things are about to get real religious. If the Lord of the Rings on prime people uh, tell the story, right. OK, if they actually go to what Tolkien actually said and tell the story right, because you know what? In this book right here, we have a description of Numenor and a description of Numenor. It describes the religion of Numenor. I guess what they did. They worshiped a Luvatar on a tall mountain. OK, um, there are other works that talk that go more deeply into how Tolkien throughout the rest of his life was actually trying to like connect all of this in a much deeper way to uh, all of the legendarium in a much deeper way to uh, Christianity, right. To the gospel itself. Um, if you look in, uh, Atherbeth, uh, Fen Fenrod, uh, Andreth, right. Which is the dialogue of, uh, Atherbeth and, and Fenrod, uh, in this text would have taken, you know, would be theoretically taking place in the first age. Uh, he basically, uh, talks about things like, uh, he, it, pr he predicts Fenrod, I believe predicts the incarnation. Okay. Um, uh, we have a discussion of uh, the fall of man, which uh, which looks a whole lot like uh, like the you know has a lot of similarities. I'll say to the biblical account of the fall of man. Um, so, and of course, we have you know the whole idea of March twenty fifth being the date of the destruction of the ring. And if you don't understand the the deep Christian significance of that date, especially for someone who's Catholic, then you're just you haven't done your research. So, 
I've got a ton of videos. I, you know, I, it's almost dinner time folks. I got to get running, <laughs> but I just had to spend a little time just going through and saying, you know, if you've seen this article, it's just way off base. Uh, you, if you got questions, shoot them to me in the comments below this thing. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter, uh, at Tolkien road and, um, lots of other places you can catch up with us, uh, Tolkien road.com. Facebook, wherever you, you can find me all over the place, Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. If you got questions about any of this stuff, hit me up. But like I said, I just want to do a quick rebuttal of this thing because uh, I, I suspect a lot of people have read it and it's just bad. It's just off base and pretty easily refutable. So people need to be refuted or people need to understand the truth. Send me this video. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.